I am. We are recording. Again. Oh, this hand. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so. Yeah, welcome back. We we have gathered here because of this. Carabaza. Yeah. My book that's coming out soon. Yeah, so this uh, chat will be all about Count Varsa. Mm -hmm. Coming out soon, perhaps sooner than perhaps I would have liked, but there is a convention coming up, so uh, we're really down to the wire on this one. I want the book out before then. That's so. what second editions are for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you, uh, if you mess up something, it's in, in a way... Okay, this is just my my personal take but if in a mm -hmm. way it is easier to patch and fix something that is already out uh, than uh, keep polishing the thing for coming out because that is a sort mm. of uh, endless uh, endless and thankless process but if it's already out uh, and you can improve on it it is emotionally a very different thing mm -hmm. I think that was one of the problems we were starting to encounter with Card of Arza is go through it mm. and then we make all the edits and then we go through it again mm. and then again and again and then it just got to the point where it's like we need to put a stop to this and just yep. release it because otherwise it's never going to get out. A book, um, a work is never complete, it's only released mm. <laughs> yeah. and all those and nice I, platitudes. I think the convention really drove home that hey we should probably put a deadline on this mm. because otherwise we're just... I, uh, we would just be turning up with secret outrunners and a bunch of advertising material for Caldervalsa, and that, you know, <laughs> it it could have worked. But I, I kind of want the book to be there, right? So, mm. uh, and the story of Caldervalsa is a long and treacherous one. <gasps> I wrote it a few, a couple of years ago. It's probably a few years now, and it just sat. I wrote it in a couple of weeks, maybe a month at most. And it sat on my hard drive for about two years, and I didn't do anything with it because it needed some significant things to bring it in line with the canon and that sort of thing. Um, so it is set in the Chaos Nova universe, uh, but it doesn't have any relation to Seeker or any of the previous works that we've released regarding Chaos Nova. Um, uh, so it's a very standalone thing. And that was another point when I started writing it. I didn't. I deliberately set out with the idea this does not tie in mm. to like the whole. I'm going to call it the Taken Flight arc. It doesn't tie mm. into that that larger arc, um, and that actually gave me quite a lot of freedom, and I could really just you know knuckle down and get into it because uh, there was no um, expectations of where the mm. story was going. There was no right. These characters have to meet up with these characters mm -hmm. to, to do this thing. It was more of right. Well, I don't have to worry about them. They're, they're off doing, doing their own thing, thing or this group is off doing their own thing. And I think, in a way, it makes the universe feel a bit more alive to know that, yeah, while this awesome story is happening, like, for example, Seeker, while that's going on elsewhere, there there are people just living their lives elsewhere in the universe and getting on with the day-to-day -day thing. So I think it brings Having that to life. regular adventures. Yeah, just, you know... I, I Yeah, so... I, I had a real good time writing it and I had a real good time editing it with, editing it with Carl as well because he um, I don't know, I think he enjoys the story mm. and that's important, you've got to have an editor who enjoys the story, right so uh, that was great, I had a real good time working on him with that so yeah let's start with the name what yeah, uh... okay uh we, me and you were talking, well, we we were discussing potential names for various things, like I think stations and mm -hmm. uh, I think planets and bits and pieces, and we were sort of, uh, I like to use the term corrupting, but it's more sort of just mashing and tweaking and that kind of thing. Uh, words mm -hmm. from various languages, mm -hmm. uh, bringing them together, tweaking them a little bit, seeing what happens. And one of those words was Caldevarza, and I think, I can't remember the, the direct root of this, I seem to think there was some sort of Slovak, maybe some African languages, and possibly uh, a tiny bit of Maori. I, I know that I was, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna also flash, flashback. So yeah. the other day, I think it was last week or something, when I was uh, checking uh, 
I was looking through some of our old world building files or some notes mm -hmm. that were for Sika because I was right. I, I was trying to find some unused uh, port names I think uh, for my own project and then from those materials two two years ago uh, so I at this point I had been hearing uh, you talking about this adventure code wars and code wars and yeah it's some it's something you made up and then mm. I scroll <laughs> down this this document uh, and I see I uh, and I see these uh, word mashups. I'm like, wait, I wrote this. <laughs> Hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a minute. And uh, and I I actually I can actually explain the etymology there. So we uh, I remember we were looking for uh, words. Uh, we were looking for names uh, for spaceports. And mm -hmm. uh, in most cases, I was uh, combining the words uh, gate and sky from different languages. And I think uh, uh, the Varza part uh, means gate. And mm -hmm. I think it was either from Lithuanian or... So it, 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 this one definitely comes from an Indo-European language. Okay, and cool. I, I would uh, I would usually do it so that I would try to combine uh, the the different parts of the name would come from different language trees. So the uh, Varza uh, part would definitely be gate uh, in Lithuanian uh, or Slovak or in in some some sort of th that sort of language, and then cow was sky, but I don't remember which which language. But uh, but yeah. <laughs> so my the yeah. Uh, my understanding of the translation uh, is heavenly gate. So I don't know if that helps trigger any memories. No, I think this is uh, this is the more sort of uh, fluffier explanation that I might ha might have given. But I remember mm. the words that I played around were uh, sky and gate and blue and port for example and and, uh, and pier for example in Sika we got the port name Kai Basiluri which was <laughs> the blue blue pier basically or pier into the blue mm -hmm. and uh, what was the other one Shelvaf that was uh, uh, word to word uh, sky port so, so basically taking real our time real world words and then cracking them cracking them down uh, in such a way that they might be uh, trans transformed over times and through different languages and then mashing them together with another that kind of word mm -hmm. uh, so that's 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 where we got this and then I forgot about I forgot all about it, <laughs> <laughs> and apparently you picked it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there. There were a few in that list. I was like, right, I I would like to lay claim to these ones, mm. right? So I think Caldevalsa was one. There's a word that essentially means massive or big, and I've snatched that up for a station in the Thanatos system uh, when we ever come to writing stories about that. What's um, the word? I can't. I can't remember what the word is, oh. but it's awesome. When you read it, it's just like that is that that belongs there, right? <laughs> it's just like bang with that. <laughs> okay, that goes there. Um, so yeah, there were a couple like that. But yeah, uh, Heavenly Gate I thought was the most appropriate because it's at the sort of like not the, I don't want to say the entrance, but it's it's a port, one of the last ports before you get to the Void Cloud mm. sort of thing. So uh, I. The Void Cloud is quite an impressive anomaly in and of itself, um, but you get a lot of sort of touristy types coming into Caldevarza mm. uh, to refuel and resupply before they then head off to the cloud for their okay. sightseeing tours and what have you. And then uh, if they don't fly directly into it, they might return <laughs> and refuel again. Si side note, you mm -hmm. have a story about... Yes. You have a story about the space station on the verge of the void cloud, it, and you yeah. dare claim that it doesn't link to the main uh, main arc. 
mean, it will. We're not, we're not gonna have we're not gonna have Corey bumping into Alicia at any point. I don't think. Like I don't tie into one another that much. Um, mm -hmm. And we did mm -hmm. our best to separate Mira's Legion from. Mm -hmm other events <laughs> so that when things, certain things happen it doesn't tie into the arc as much but I can see what you're saying yeah. it's kind of it's like you're not gonna I, I don't think Gnarly's ever gonna turn up at Caldevaza for example like it, it won't work like that like he he might but it's not a story that I'd cover right if that makes sense here's here's what I mean uh, the Void Cloud is already a sort of huge plot point or plot mm. space-time wedgie so anything that is in direct connection with it uh, you can't help it. it it is somehow already connected <laughs> so <laughs> oh. so there there uh. goes your independent uh, uh, innocent little adventure <laughs> this <Damn> clip <laughs> But uh, t uh. tell me, tell me more about the adventure itself, or the tell me, tell me about the uh, the station itself at first. Okay, so so yeah, as as I said, Cloud of Arzer, it's sort of a tourist pool. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot of tourists coming in, um, and it's home to. Uh, we follow three people in this story. We follow Elise Rivera. Mm -hmm. She's who I call the outsider. Mm -hmm. uh, she has come from a long way away and. When it comes to dealing with stuff on the station, she takes a very different approach to what the people of Caldevarza would would usually think is the right approach. And mm. uh, yeah, sometimes it can get her into trouble. Sometimes it works out. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's Elise, and I love Elise. She, I started writing that character. There's, I don't know what it is, but I've, for years I've been saving certain names. Mm -hmm. So like Elise is like a quote-unquote special name in my mind. I've only ever met nice Elise's in my life. <laughs> the Lo Lotus Car Company released a car called the Elise and it was a Aww. fabulous car. So that's one of those names that I've sort of been saving up and I was like, this is going to be uh, for a special character. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started working on her sort of character concept, I was like, this this is Elise. This hmm. She cannot be anyone other than Elise. So she got that name. Um, and I love her. She, she, she doesn't crack jokes. So her thing is, she doesn't crack jokes, but she sort of, and she doesn't really say inappropriate things. She says the appropriate thing, but it's at the wrong time. If that makes oh, sense. Like, okay. <laughs> it's more the timing of the thing that she says, um, and she speaks her mind a little bit, not to the point that Rogue sort of does, but she, she really, she speaks her mind a little bit. Um, Okay, so that so she lives on the station now. She's come from paradise. Uh, Casca Stone is another character that we follow, um, and she is sort of like an aide for the for the elected official who runs the station. Uh, so she's she's a cool character as well. I like her. She's very mature, very sensible, mm. and very dedicated to her job and Caldevaza. Like she. Her whole thing is making sure that the the station continues to function, mm. essentially. Um, so that's her role. And then you've got Joseph Raffa, and he's sort of like the military aspect of Caldevaza. Mm. He he and several others are responsible for the station's defence. Uh, and when things go wrong, uh, from an outsider perspective, they they're the ones who usually have to go and meet it or they're the ones who are checking ships before they board the station and things like that. So mm. it's just sort of like a day-to-day -day thing. Um, and then you've got like sort of side characters uh, like Tack Winters and Icarus Brook are sort of... Um, they're side characters, but they're important in their own way and they're mm. Raffa's aides. They help him out a lot of the time. And Icarus is... Fant he's so sensible and so smart and at one point at least he's like I can't I can't talk <laughs> down to him he's like the smartest guy on the station like you know um, that's just her opinion of him um, and he balances Winters who and Winters is very much well we should do this now we should go and solve this problem now and we don't need evidence because gathering evidence just gives them more time to prepare so we should just strike now while the iron is hot mm. and Icarus is sort of like well we need to temper this approach and we need to are we running headlong into a trap so they're, they're great characters 
Uh, Gian Evos, he runs the station and he's very much a father figure for a lot of the characters and mm. he um, he's great. Um, uh, the, the interesting thing about a lot of these characters was I started writing okay so I had a very clear idea of Elise. I was mm. like I know where she comes from I know what her thing is after, after giving her a name I was like right all these pieces <laughs> place. I started writing Casca and the original intention I think was for Guerre to be a main character and not Casca but actually, Casca took hold of my pen and my fingers and was like, this is the story we're telling now. I am this, as the <laughs> character, this is the story we're going down, oh, okay. right? And the same thing happened with Icarus. And uh, I was just writing away and da, 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 da. And, and Icarus was just like, oh, yeah, but you never talk about my husband. And I was like, oh, wait, so he, he's gay? Oh, excellent, okay. <laughs> okay. It, 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 it's the most organic thing ever. It felt perfect for the character. I mean, like, it just... Everything just fit into place really nicely with, with most of these characters. And, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's... it's The first two-thirds are sort of like a character story for the three of them. Like, the uh, they're really developing and sort of showing how their lives are... Mm -hmm. Their, their lives are normally and then something happens to change that and then how do they then react to this mm. uh, and then the last sort of third of the book is more military sci-fi mm. based um, uh, and I think like uh, lo I think Lost Fleet and Lost Stars has got a lot to play into that mm. because I was reading a lot of that at the time um, and it really inspired me. I was like, how would Chaos Nova handle this? Like, how mm. would we deal with this? And I don't think in Lost Fleet, space battles are so common. Like, they happen all the mm -hmm. goddamn time. Uh, but I think actually in space, because space is so massive, the two sides have got to want to fight each other. Mm -hmm. and they've, got yep. to want, they've both got to believe that they can win, right? And there's a couple of instances where we talk about this in the in in the book and uh yeah i just think that if two sides were coming at each other across the distance of space as you're drawing closer to your potential demise one side would think hang on this is probably a bad idea oh, we should turn around we've had we've had essentially days to think about what we're doing here and we haven't changed course ridiculous we need to get out uh, so i think yeah. also we don't even need to be here <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We could just go. Let's just go. <laughs> you know. So the time scale of things is a little uh, dif different in space. Like it's different to a naval engagement on Earth, 100%. And I think that's I think that's um, Jack Campbell's background is very naval military, mm -hmm. whereas I have never been in the military. <laughs> the closest that I've ever got is is hanging out in like Cold War bunkers and talking about mm -hmm. outrunners, the Kingsley Army. And one of the main things talk about Outrunners real quick. One of the main things I set out to do in Outrunners, because I didn't know anything about the military but knew there was going to be a military element, one of the first things they do is reorganize the military. It's a it's an apocalypse situation. <laughs> things we can't use the same things that we were doing beforehand. We need to sort of adapt to this situation. Mm. So I was like, I don't know anything about the military, so this is how I'm gonna play. <laughs> so let's <this>. redesign. <laughs> yeah. And I think that plays in a bit in Caldavaza. I have not got the foggiest about naval warfare. Um, and I think because I'm not coming from that perspective, maybe I've handled space battles in a unique way, let's say. <laughs> and, and this is, this is going to be another one of our favourite terms, is case-by-case -case basis, right? Mm -hmm. So the space battles in Caldavaza might happen slightly differently to other space battles elsewhere, or they might not. I don't know. It's the first time we've done this. It's it's <laughs> as big a leap as it is for the reader as it is for yeah. me. So we shall see. I I, uh, I feel like I would like a tangent a little bit. Ooh, so yeah, so regarding uh, regarding oh what's happened? What happened? Uh, your your screen went blank for a second. I think your screensaver ki kicked in. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Blackout. Uh, yeah. So regarding potential space battles in uh, in Chaos Nova setting uh, I remember that one one very poignant point was that 
and, and that relates to the idea that both sides really really need to want to battle to even mm-hmm. come together is that uh, we can't really have space battles as an everyday thing because there's there's really no need yeah like because yeah. we uh, the worlds that we're looking at uh, they are kind of uh, they are in the stage of uh, colonization mm. like there there's been a few millennia of successful colonization so surely there there would be certain points of conflict but uh, those those points of conflict might be point one uh, might be specific little points on specific rocks mm-hmm. not somewhere in in the vacuum and uh, and even so uh, for now there's plenty of space for everybody to go around so you would really yeah. you would really need to have a very specific reason to even fight uh, and when it comes to uh, sort of close up hand to hand stuff uh, I, I dare say I have directed it all into a more uh, middle ages sort of thing where you have small raiding parties mm-hmm. you, you, yeah. go, you go raid your competitor's compound, maybe you kill their family, you take the goods and you leave but you don't uh, you don't necessarily build blockades on the orbit or you don't yet mm-hmm. you you might in, in some future <laughs> stories but yeah. but like we're we're not there yet and another tactical thing that uh, that we have to uh, have to acknowledge when it comes to fighting fighting or uh, conflicts in in space is that if you have two sides coming at each other and one of them doesn't really want to do it then they can transit mm-hmm. away yeah Gone. so so if uh, if you actually get to the point that you have two sides in space and fighting then those fights are more likely to utilize uh, uh, combat max and and you know basically close close combat in space <laughs> Because from a far away conflict, your your opponent can just jump away. I mean, un- unless unless they are really motivated to stay put and uh, and defend some certain point, which is of course a another sort of yeah. So they they need to they either need to have a strong motivator, mm-hmm. but even so, uh, I I would I would I would argue that uh, the sort of Clo- close-up space combat is uh, is more is more of a thing. Yeah. And tangent. And <laughs> I think when it comes to KD two, because this is the other thing, I never set out to write something with a sequel, right? I just mm-hmm. set out to write one book, and it ended up being a sequel, like needing a sequel. Mm. I've wrapped up as many threads within Cloud of Oz one <laughs> as is. Feasibly reasonable for the story, right? Mm. Feasonable, let's call it. <laughs> feasonable. <laughs> for the story. So, but it does need a, a sequel if we're going to really conclude this story. And in that sequel, I think the space battles are not going to... There's, there's going to be a, an absolute, we're not having space battles sort of rule in place like it should be a more personal on the ground Mm -hmm. what are the characters doing kind of thing because as much fun as it is to be flying around with Vipka and Manbacker and all those sorts of mad ships um, you're right it doesn't make sense really within the Chaos Nova universe to have these space battles because you can just (laughs) and out right Mm -hmm. so um, they they shouldn't be sort of like a riding factor of the next one and they're not really a riding factor of this one I mean I don't want to give too much away, obviously, but there are reasons why events happen the way they do. Like, the mm-hmm. the two sides both believe they are in a position of advantage. One side has to come to the other side, uh, be- and, the other- and this side think uh, by staying where they are, they have a point of advantage. Uh, and then in the, ne- the following system, there is also another reason um, <laughs> why they why they fight 
Um, and that's also full of drama and and it's more down to how does how does how does Rafa and Winters and Elise react to what's going on outside the ship and the effects hmm. of what's happening outside the ship are having on their ship. So it's, it's yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but there are some real personal moments in this story and uh, I mean loss is also a thing. Like I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not picking holes in Lost Fleet, right? I love that <laughs> series more than anything on the planet. I've got all the Lost Fleet, Lost Stars books, but there's a certain element of when, uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of when people, when crew members died, it was a big thing, and then mm. as time went on, it was sort of just like nodded to, and mm. sort of like, oh, we we lost X amount of people, blah blah blah. And I really didn't want that with mm. this story. I wanted sort of every every person to sort of count. You know, these were all people. Mm -hmm. These like, they were serving their station. They wanted to protect their home, sort of thing. So the, there's some real personal stories, and I think you know, I just I think I've done an okay job, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I enjoyed it. I find myself. I'll start. Re I'll start reading it at like chapter three or four when we're starting to make the edits, and before I know it, it'll be dark outside. I'm at the epilogue and I've read the whole thing, and it's just like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, let's do. Uh, uh, oh, what happens next? You know. So it's it's not a cliffhanger either. I made very mm. sure to avoid a cliffhanger. I wanted to resolve as much as possible like I said, feasibly, but I, there are certain threads, but I don't think the reader's going to feel like, oh, well, I must know what happened. It's more a case of, okay, so that's going on. Maybe we'll touch on that in the future, but it, it's, you know, it, I don't need to know about it right now. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. interesting story, but it's not, you know, I could take or leave it right now, which I think is better, you know. <laughs> If 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 I I don't want to sound morbid, but if I get hit by a bus or struck by lightning tomorrow, there's never going to be a Coward of Oz two, right? So Coward of Oz one is going to have to stand alone, and you know I think it can do that. Um, and if I do get hit by lightning tomorrow, then people can make up their own assumptions about what happens in Coward of Oz two, you know. So there you go. So the story that stands on its own, give us some plot. I I, okay, I know so I I know you don't want to give away too much, I'm not give but too uh, much, but you but have to give us enough to care. Essentially, Elise, Elise, oh. Elise, <laughs> <laughs> Elise. My voice is finally breaking. It's only taken what a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Elise Rivera, I can't say that name. Elise Rivera has uh, has been living on Caldevar's station for a little while now. She, uh, she's she got to know the layout of the place, but she hasn't really made any friends. And uh, she's she's got aspirations that don't really fit with what Caldevar's normally do. She wants, mm. to, she wants to do things differently and, you know, really buck the trend sort of thing. And uh, it lands her in a bit of hot water, let's say. So okay. she immediately sort of comes into odds, comes at odds with Caldevarza. Um She has a real internal torment about, you know, whether she should move on, whether she should move to a different place, because as far as she's concerned, her home is still undergoing some rocky stuff. Um, she comes from a place called Paradise, a small mining town slash settlement um, that is sort of it's it's called Paradise. A bit of a misnomer, but there you go. And she mm. used to live there. She's now moved to Caldervasa. What she's, system? Say again. What system? Yernto. Okay. So near the Lishan Rice Star, um, underneath. We quote unquote your space, which I mean, we need more clarification mm -hmm. on that, but we're not tackling that in this book, so that can come later. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, at least she sort of comes into some of the people on the station. Um, and the people on the station, so you've got Casca Stone, she works for the sort of command core of the station, and she has detected an incoming freighter that will not respond to any hails it's not beaconing any help messages or anything like that it is literally just on course to the station and anytime they move the station it moves 
in order to keep going towards the station, essentially. So, uh, that's a big problem. Caldevaza has dealt with attempted takeovers before in the past, and they like to nip this stuff in the bud before it becomes a problem. So, they have to figure out how they're going to deal with this. Mm. Um, so, they send out Comcap Joseph Raffa to save the day. But unfortunately, all of Caldevaza's ships are mysteriously suffering from problems. The engineering oh. department aren't really pulling their weight. Um, so they have to send Joseph Raffer out in a transport ship. Not an armed warship of any kind. They have to send oh, no. him out in like the most basic transport ship. Very poorly defended. You know, it's not the ship he would have chosen for the job. And that in itself leads to all sorts of problems. Um, so there are elements from all over. You've got sort of like the people running the engineering bay. They're causing their own problems, and there's a big mm. to do with them later. And yeah, they they're sort of just trying to make money. But that is also at odds with what the sort of command mm. core team want. And there's a bit of friction between the specialists and the engineers because they can never sort of come to terms with what one another <laughs> wants essentially. Um, so there's a lot of that and at least she ah uh, at least she ends up in hot water man um but there's a moment where she redeems herself and i think she she's one of the more valuable people so because of her outside thinking because she doesn't do things how like okay so when you become a specialist you sort of get trained in certain things you don't just Congratulations, you're a specialist now, <laughs> and these are your tasks, go and do them. It's more like, okay, so these are how you would do these tasks, mm -hmm. and if we can improve on them in the future, great. There will be a council, and there will be lots of red tape, and all meetings and stuff will happen, and then maybe we might possibly change a thing. Uh, but this is how you do your job. Whereas Elise is brought in, and because of her outside perspective, she really bucks the trend like she does not do the things that the normal specialist would do and in cases that does end her in hot water and in other cases it's it really solves some problems but there's an element and another character that i haven't touched on is uh coda trust and she's just she's just cool i like coda she's another specialist she sort of hangs about and she's the one who you know, she's 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 Casca's mate. You know, mm. they're like they're like buddies. You know, Casca <laughs> and Coda, they're cool. Um, and uh, it's it it eventually dawns on a lot of people that combined, at least on her own, it can do some pretty impressive things. But together with another specialist who has been in this job for a while and has been doing things uh, the way they've been sort of trained together as a team, they can really work through some of the problems that Caldevaser is facing. So, there's a lot of elements of that. Um, I don't want to give Wait. too much of the plot away, yeah. but... Oh, go on. Uh, you ask a question? What, what specialists are they? Are they or engineers, or...? Oh, okay, so they're, they're sort of like command core specialists. So mm. they're specialists at running the station, essentially. So okay. they're... I, I think the easiest way to be like a control tower? Mm. They, they run the control tower at the at the center of Caldevaza. Um They might they might manage the traffic that's coming in. They might manage the sort of supply logistics and habitats and the sort of just everyday day to day running of the station. Essentially, like have we got enough mm. supplies for the next X cycles? You know. Mm. So uh, yeah, they do a lot of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't want to give too much away. So I'm not going to say anything beyond the point of the freighter and sort of Elise and Casca coming together and doing their thing. Um, but there's, yeah, there are some real heavy character moments. And I made a choice, and I don't think you're going to like this, but <gasps> tulips, oh no. tulips are a thing. Okay, so Caldevaza, for whatever reason, managed to, through trading with other places or whatever, managed to get hold of some some tulips at some point in their travels in the Chaos Nova universe. And uh, it's a real poignant moment later on in the story that I, I, I really love this moment. I think it's one of the best moments <laughs> I've ever written. And, and to be honest, I wrote it, thought it was great. Cole came in and tweaked it a little bit, made it, you know, <laughs> he put the icing on the cake, essentially. So... Um, that's that's my one decision is that tulips 
somehow made it to Caldevada and they are usually reserved for the rich citizenry um, because they're like rare and expensive and what have you but that was the one choice I'm so yeah I'm sorry <laughs> well when it when it comes to when it comes to any life form or any breed or or uh, or whatever making it into somewhere in in the universe uh Basically, all you need is one person's decision to include it in in the in the world building thing. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, so world building tangent ahead. <laughs> Wee, let's go. <laughs> so, of course, uh, when we're talking about uh, what's essentially a decorative flower, mm -hmm. then either it wasn't supposed to be part of the build-up ecosystem or uh, or it must have had a role uh, in the in the early terraformer ecosystem build-up so mm. so it, it's better if you if you're able to establish what that role was of course there is there is always the uh, the possibility that somebody smuggled in uh, a few buds and yeah. uh, and and put and put them to breed somewhere and uh, that uh, this is indeed one person's one personal thing uh, and the whole uh, population of tulips that we have in the map space is the result of that one decision what? that would be cool See, that's a nice. Yeah. That gives it a nice backstory. Yeah, yeah. Because this this way you don't even have to explain uh, why uh, why you would have uh, why you would have tulips in uh, in an ecosystem that is maybe more geared towards utility than decoration, mm -hmm. and uh, more geared towards producing lots of biomass fast and and balancing it. But uh, indeed, if somebody basically smuggled smuggled some buds on board, uh, it it can totally work. And it's and this would yeah. The other side of it is it could, I mean, if if uh, this might be a bit stereotypical, but the Dutch, if they put together a culture kit for to travel into space and a culture kit that reminds them of their sort of heritage and where they came from and all this and that they might have tulips potentially uh, well uh, there, here's the thing point one uh, right now mm. you're thinking in terms of countries whereas uh, yes. uh, the okay, expeditions yeah, I, I think one one point that I, I want to establish one point that I, I will uh, go to battle for <laughs> is that a lot of the expeditions are not think of one country but instead no. they, they yeah, are no, collaborations that. and within those yeah. collaborations uh, we will have strange bedfellows uh, another mm -hmm. thing is that the culture kit is information Culture kit is yeah, not things; yeah. it's information. So, if you want to have uh, physical tulips, I think it makes uh, better sense worldwide and more poignant sense story-wise if somebody's great, 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 great grandparent uh, smuggled yeah. it in uh, during their expedition. That, because, yeah. because reasons. That's canon now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we said it, now it's canon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how it works, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I, I don't think there's much more I can say about that, Cal Devars. Mm. I mean, I had a uh, great time working with Carl. Uh, check him out. I think it's wordpress.colrolf.com. Um, I'm gonna have to put the link in the description. I don't remember yeah. it from by heart. I so have check it him out. I think linked. Possibly you. I think he advertises as an editor and proofreader on his website. So possibly. I you think so. With jobs, uh, he's he's yeah. It was just a pleasure to work with him. He really knuckles down on details. I think um, the maths. Uh, uh, completely eluded me, so I thank him for his input on that part. Definitely, 
And uh, like I said, he, I thought I had a, and this might be tooting my own horn, but then I suppose if you're an author and you write a story and you don't think it's good, then what was the point of writing the story in the first place? But my point is, um, I wrote the story, Caldevaza, and I thought it was good. I thought it was really good. I love reading. And then Carl came and weaved his editorial magic, like you editor elves do, with your strange <laughs> black magic and all that hocus pocus, and just made it phenomenal, right? And I don't know if that's, you know, it's a bit tooting my own horn. Oh yeah, I wrote this story, and then this guy came along and made it just awesome, you know. It feels like tooting my own horn a bit, but I mean, he really blew it mm -hmm. out of the park and really brought... There were some personal moments, okay, so there's, there's a little bit of romance, uh, and I I got the first one okay. There were no real major changes needed to the first one. The second one, though, Jesus wept. He took what I wrote and essentially rewrote it uh, <laughs> word for word. Like, not didn't copy me at all. He, he made a totally different version. Um, and he's just really brought out a lot of those personal moments and really made them work. So, yeah, thank you to Carl for that. That's awesome. Um, Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so glad yeah. to hear that that's, that method is not uh, only what I do, is that uh, yeah. first, first uh, read the first draft, yell at you, have you rewrite the whole thing, <laughs> read the second draft, yell at you some more, yeah. make you, yeah, make you redo the whole thing, and then take the... Take the third draft and then rip it apart and <laughs> rewrite it myself. Just sort of cram some bits of one and two in there, mate. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm, I'm glad to hear out. that uh, I I'm not the only one doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a bit more uh, personal when me and you do it because when we were working on Seeker together, like we uh, we were co-authors, right? Mm -hmm. And in this instance, well, Carl I wasn't is the first. That's that's the thing. Not, not uh, at first, but then we... As I got more involved, I became the co-author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think because we were so both so invested in it, whereas Carl was sort of come onto this as as uh, sort of third person, if mm, you will, more the clear-headed. Yeah. Mm, so okay. there were issues with that, of course. Working with someone who isn't as familiar with the universe uh -huh. has its own problems, um, like. You sort of have to explain time scales and things like that, like uh, kiloseconds and megaseconds. Like I think he knew what they were, but I mm. I did a little table on the side of one of the documents to be like, right, this is what this is. Um, and there are some times where we catch each other out. Like he'll, I think there was, there's one like personal transport vehicle, uh, which is sort of just like a little thing they used to get around mm -hmm. the station. Um, and the first time. It's mentioned it is spelt out in full personal transport vehicle, but then every time after that it's referred to as PTV. Mm -hmm. And he was like, <laughs> we were editing one day and he highlighted PTV, and I was like, well, he was like, well, this is the first time it's mentioned, so it needs to be in full. I highlighted a word, a sentence above personal <laughs> transport vehicle, <laughs> and he was like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, there have been moments oh. like that, but that's great. I love little moments like that. They end up in funny stories that I can then tell people of YouTube, so, you know. Um, that was that was cool. Um, and it's just, any any mm -hmm. other stories from the trenches of rewriting um, and editing? There are probably a few, and I don't <laughs> think this is going to be our our last Caldevar's uh, video. Mm. Possibly we might do some more on this. Um, but yeah, no, I think for, from the trenches, the most astonishing thing that stood out to me is how these characters like Cas like uh, yeah, like Casca and Icarus took the story and and th they wanted to tell essentially like I was just writing for the characters and they were like well this is the direction we're taking this and I just sort of went with it and it ended up resulting in uh, in what and, and again I don't feel I, I feel a bit cheeky saying yeah I've written great story but <laughs> they, it has resulted in, in personally a great story so yeah I think just letting the characters do their own thing there are of course limits to that Elise had a very clear picture of what she was doing in her mind, uh, and I knew I was in. Me and Elise were on the same wavelength. <laughs> me and Casca, we're on different machines, right? So she was like, "I'm doing this," <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. You're kind of a badass." So she, uh, <laughs> that's that's how that ended up. Um, but yeah, it was just it was just great fun. Um, it, I'm good. The next, okay, so the next project, they're, they're sort of like. like 
There's some things flying around. But I wanna I'm gonna relax on Caldevaza for mm -hmm. a bit. In a couple of years' time there might be a Caldevaza the cycles between, which mm -hmm. is just going to be a couple of chapters, short story kind of thing, between Caldevaza and Caldevaza 2 to sort of say, mm. well, kind of happened. Just to maybe to tie people over if people want some more Caldevaza, then a little sample while we're working on other things like taking flight and split personality. Um, but I think I'm going to step back. <laughs> Once Caldevaza is out, I'm going to step the F back for a minute. <laughs> And I'm going to try and organise all the notes and I'm going to try and, and, and mm. bring some stuff together because I'm looking through my personal workspace on the Google Drive and it's mm. a mess. I've got my folders up here. Yeah, they're organised, but the notes within them are all a mess. Mm. And if anything happens to either side, also, the for we really need to back up the forum, mm. right? Mm. If, if that gets... If, Dark BB pulls that down for inactivity or whatever, then we've lost all that stuff. So I really mm. need to get my arse in gear and get that forum stuff sorted. If any of this stuff ever gets deleted, right, not backed up properly, obviously it's on my Google Drive and on my hard drive. I download it at re regular mm. intervals now. If there's ever a fire in this house, I'm screwed, right? <laughs> so I need to organise all this, create a sort of, I don't know, much more organised version and then make sure I've got it backed up somewhere and backed up a second place as well so that if anything does happen to any of this, mm. this universe that we've been working on for the last five years or, or how it, maybe even longer than that, like eight years possibly, <laughs> it feels like <laughs> decades. Um, me and Keo started all those years ago. It needs an organised focus. And I think I'm going to step back from the storytelling mm. and I'm just going to focus down on trying to get stuff organised. Um, because there's another point that Carl made was, uh, and this was the other thing, like I said, bringing in an editor who's not as familiar with the material, mm -hmm. and stuff needed explaining, uh, a Bible or some... In a a uh, wiki. Some expla yeah, a, yeah, a wiki, essentially, of explanation. Of, well, what's a reclaimer? You know, so stuff like that. Well, I maybe that was a bad example, but you <laughs> know what I mean, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We need something like that. Uh, not least for ourselves, but also when we bring other people mm -hmm. in and they need this stuff to uh, explain. Which is fair enough. The Chaos Nova universe is a vast and very confusing place sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, when it comes to mm, perpetuity and uh, preserving the work that's done, actually there is another method that is that is also kind of like extra insurance is to get more stories out there so that the critical mass of the fiction verse is within the readers minds and mm -hmm. that they can sort of keep on telling the stories yeah <laughs> a culture kit if you will Oh. Because yeah. uh, the the point of the culture kits, so this this might differ from expedition to expedition, and I, I'm gonna tangent into my my own uh, stories and my own characters now. But mm -hmm. basically, uh, if one uh, expedition has like just an info trove, which the uh, expedition members can relate to however they want. Uh, then let's say some specific expeditions might have a very sort of uh, purposeful, targeted, uh, focused approach where not only do they have information but they also have a sort of plan in place how to uh, how to make use of the information, how to carry on the traditions. Mm. So this this is something that I, I'm uh, I'm planning to tackle. Yeah. 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 Mm. <laughs> but, but that is distance, that is a story for another day. <laughs> or not uh, not in terms of distance, but in terms of proximity, uh Cow Vaza in the Wind and system is actually quite close to Ekarana if mm. memory swerves. So yeah. Yeah, it's so funny I, uh, how it's funny how for the longest time our focus has been on Rystar, uh taking flight was Tucker Nine, so I think that's in the lead and system I want to say I don't our know. Seeker was our chaos region and then for both of our next stories we've literally gone to the other end of the 2D map like we're 
or chaos in terms of things, I suppose, is on your screen would be down here. And then Caldevada and everything is up here. Mm. And Necron is up here. So we've... Yeah, somewhere in the middle there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's good. I think it's good that we're exploring other regions of the... the uh, this this also this also gives the chance to uh, show how different the worlds can be. Mm. So even even though their origins would link back to uh, the same era in uh, in Earth development, like you you do have the technology that makes uh, that gives you the possibility to build a mega project. Uh, that allows you to uh, build up a biosphere, biosphere on on an alien planet, and to get there. <laughs> so all all that is shared. But uh, once you take that uh, that shared element and uh, give each uh, starting block a little bit different nudge, you can get uh, vastly different worlds and vastly different cultures. <laughs> There's a lot of that in Cow of Oz where, uh, for example, Icarus will be telling her, or he will say to her, I have something to tell you, for example, and mm -hmm. she'll sort of be like, well, tell me, and he'll be like, well, we need to do this in a meeting room or a briefing room, like, as is the usual, you know, mm -hmm. so like little things like that, mm -hmm. I think, you know, little cultural things. And at least does not react well. Listen very carefully. I will say this only once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, I I think the key thing is that Cow Divisor is coming out soon. It's available for pre-order on Amazon, and I'm I'm cool with the pre-order thing because essentially I needed to get an Amazon page so I can put a link to where oh. people can buy the book. Uh, on the advertising material, oh, okay. essentially. So, if if there was a way of doing this without pre-ordering, because I mm, when it comes to video okay. games and stuff, I buy into that shit far too much, and I don't really want to <laughs> cultivate that culture of pre-orders and pre-order bonuses and you know add-ons and all this sort of crap. Like, I know that doesn't happen with books, but <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to sell you the first 26 chapters. There is no bonus, the folks. <laughs> the 27th chapter is behind a paywall, you know. Uh, it doesn't work like that in books, um, so that's never going to happen. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, I got the pre-order page up because I needed the link for advertising mm, okay. material, and so that's available now. And I'm sure there will be a link, either a pinned comment or in the description, because uh, mm -hmm. I can do the pinned comment. I cannot be lazy, um, or I can do the comment and you can pin it. So there we go. Teamwork Ooh. makes dream work. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's I kind of I kind of like Seekers the pinned one because it has like a hundred retweets. Oh no, not on Twitter. On um, oh oh okay oh on yeah on, on yeah on site of course. Duh. Yeah on YouTube. <laughs> okay um, yeah. I would never want to take that away, man. Mm. That Seeker advert is riding strong, man. Yeah, you have nailed that Twitter account. Um, so I've got nothing else to say. Please check out my latest book. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's one ninety nine uh, in all regions, so it's one dollar ninety nine or one pound ninety nine or one euro ninety nine, depending on where you are, or hundred ninety nine yen, I think. Um, so, um, what was I going to say real quick? Uh, the ebook's going to be cheaper, obviously, because I don't have to print the ebook, and because the paperback is like. 500 pages long it's going to be more expensive than mm -hmm. Seeker and Outrunners um, so that Obviously. is one thing to bear in mind <laughs> yeah so that's one thing to just bear in mind it's probably better to get the ebook version but <laughs> I, I mean if you want a hardback copy then fantastic thank you so much um, um, and if you ever see me in public with one of our books bring it up to me and I will sign it I'm <laughs> fully behind that but, uh, so there you go uh, before that's we, all I got yeah, before we wrap up uh, can you mm. point out any excerpts or maybe readings of the story? Oh, actually, yes, but they will be in the pinned comment as well because we are working with some of our old friends, Adeline Green, and he is actually going to do a reading of some of these chapters for us. Um, so that'll be there. And I'm sure in the coming days I will post a couple of excerpts to okay. the Chaos Nova website as well. So that'll be that. In fact, uh, they'll probably come hand in hand, so if you want to listen to Adeline's version and read along at the same time, that will be possible. So, yeah. Check our webpage for details. 
it's it's a pretty page. Yeah. You can check it just just in case. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, shall we wrap this up? Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. <laughs>